On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. The only thing I know to do within my realm, my sphere of influence, is to shape young people into compassionate, knowledgeable leaders who are willing to take responsibility. I do that in the hope and with faith that they will take what they learn and bring about change, positive change in the world, that one day we will be led by people who will not tolerate what is going on in Syria or Venezuela or so many places of pain and anguish in the world. That's that's what I feel I can contribute. Stephanie Ansaldo is founder and president of the ECHO Foundation, an education foundation for humanity and peace. The ECHO Foundation invites world-renowned humanitarians to deliver messages that inspire citizens to action on behalf of humankind. Stephanie previously served as a family therapist at Charlotte Latin School and led her own private practice in family therapy. She is a recipient of several honors and awards including the Mayor's International Cabinet Richard Vinroot Achievement Award, the UNC Charlotte Inaugural Bob Barrett Social Justice Award, and the State of North Carolina Order of the Longleaf Pine. In this episode, we explore the work of the ECHO Foundation, a life of service, and what one person can do to change the world. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Stephanie, what is the ECHO Foundation? The ECHO Foundation is a small nonprofit uh, dedicated to teaching young people, high school students primarily, that they have a responsibility to humankind, that each one of us has gifts and talents that the world needs and that it is our responsibility to contribute those for the betterment of humanity. How does the ECHO Foundation go about that work? We create educational programs. We have five initiatives. The largest and most well-known one is called Voices Against Indifference. In that, we bring on an annual basis a world-renowned humanitarian who has lived the answer to our mantra, what can one person do? Using their talent, they've made a contribution to humanity. They've changed the world for people in any number of ways. They are an example to our students of what one person can do with dedication, with commitment, with the desire to have an impact, a positive impact in the world. Who are some of those humanitarians who the ECHO Foundation have invited to Charlotte? Elie Wiesel is my co-founder, and he's visited and been our focus three times in the 20 years of ECHO's existence. Wally Shoinka, who won the Nobel Literature Prize in 1986, has been our guest, a man who uses his substantial talent for writing essays, plays, autobiography, poetry, an amazing man, uses his talent 
in service to humanity. Another person, Bernard Kushner, who was the son of a doctor and became a doctor living in Paris, went to Biafra during the war in the 60s and couldn't believe what he saw. And so he asked his colleagues from med school, come join us. Others, Ben Bernanke, an economist, Carrie Kennedy, an activist for women and children. The idea is that we bring people from different sectors so that we communicate to young people, it doesn't matter what your profession, what your talent, we need you all. And when these humanitarians come, What is it that they do? In preparation for their visit to Charlotte, we create at the ECHO office with student summer interns, we create curriculum about that person's life and work. Then we disseminate those curricula to teachers across the region who in turn teach about the person who is going to be our guest. When the person arrives, let's say Paul Farmer, who is one of the creators of Partners in Health, the students gather at any number of different high schools. That year it was at South Mech. And they ask, they have a dialogue with Dr. Farmer. So when Elie Wiesel was coming the first time, I was thinking he would give a lecture to students. And he said to me, oh, Stephanie, students don't like lectures. Let's make it a dialogue. Let them ask me questions, and I'll do my best to answer those. That became our format, very successfully so. And the students, after studying whoever's coming, the humanitarian, then have these urgent, brilliant questions, better questions than any adults, any of us, have. And so we have a dialogue. We have a student dialogue, the students with the guest. And what is the impact of that encounter? What comes of it? Fundamentally, I would tell you, each year, each month, each day, it's an act of faith. We believe at Echo in the sanctity and worth of every human soul. There are few ways to measure the impact a student has from interacting with someone who has changed the world. Of course, we do pre- and post-evaluations, and we have metrics, and we can tell you how many students change their attitude. But in fact, the impact lasts a lifetime. Sometimes, most often, we never actually know. I do receive emails and letters from students frequently how ECHO has impacted them. One student was going to be a literature professor and decided instead to go to law school and defends death row inmates now. Another student was going to follow a writing career and is in med school today. A science teacher, the head of science at Huff High School, told me before ECHO and the nine science laureates that we've brought to Charlotte, before that time, she could count two, three, maybe four graduating seniors who would say they were going to specialize in science. Today, after these young people meet the laureates, she said, I can tell you 24 today who've made a career of science. The impact is huge. So you can measure some of it and lots of it is faith. In 2006, ECHO launched an initiative called In the Footsteps of Elie Wiesel. What is that initiative? That initiative is one of the things I love best. It was invented by my students who said, Mrs. Ansaldo, how can we have a global perspective if we've never left Charlotte, North Carolina? And you need to do something about that. So we decided to celebrate ECHO's 10th anniversary that we would create a new initiative and we would take students in the footsteps of Elie Wiesel believing that perhaps if we walk on the same land, on the same ground, breathe the same air that he breathed, 
that something would transform in us, that we too would be committed to making a difference in the world. And so we launch the initiative with In the Footsteps of Elie Wiesel was our first. That was followed by Footsteps in Rwanda. And we have, since that time, we have studied Bosnia, we've studied Cuba, we have traveled to those places. We also have studied Lexington, North Carolina, where poverty hit when the outsourcing of the furniture industry occurred. During the presidential election of 2012, we had students travel to Tampa and also in Charlotte to the RNC and the DNC. The idea behind it is that students compete for 12 positions. It is where we spend an enormous amount of time and energy and go deep with learning, with information, with exposure, with opportunity. We study in Charlotte from January until June, and then we travel to the destination that we've been studying. Stephanie, we referenced Elie Wiesel. Who is Elie Wiesel, and what is his importance and connection to the ECHO Foundation? Elie Wiesel won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1986. He's a Holocaust survivor and has spent his life as a witness. His mantra is against indifference, that we should not turn away when we see injustice. He was a teacher and a writer. He wrote the book Night about his experience in the camp as a young person. The book is taught across the country to over six million students uh, in the last 20 years. He is the voice of the Holocaust. He reminds us never to relax, never to forget that we must remain vigilant and not allow injustice and intolerance to go unchecked. And how is it that the ECHO Foundation came about? So I'm a family therapist. I was working at Charlotte Latin School, and I went to a conference. Elie Wiesel was the keynote speaker. And I positioned myself so that I could quickly go and meet him after his speaking was finished. We met, I invited him to Charlotte, and he said, write to me and we'll see. So I wrote to him for three years. Each time he answered, oh, I'm traveling, I'm so sorry, oh, I'm teaching, maybe another time. He always answered. But then his book, All Rivers Run to the Sea, was published. It's a memoir, a continuation of night, and in it he gave me the roadmap. He told the story after World War II, he was working for a newspaper, an Israeli newspaper. They wanted an interview with the Prime Minister of France, Midas France, and were unsuccessful in gaining access to him. So Elie went to his office, and he was turned away. He left a note behind that said, Dear Mr. Prime Minister, if you refuse to grant me an interview, one of two things will happen. My newspaper will go bankrupt, cabling you, or I will lose my job. In either case, the responsibility is yours. So attached to my formal letter on Charlotte Latin Stationery was my own handwritten note. Dear Professor Wiesel, if you refuse my invitation, one of two things will happen. My school will go bankrupt with postage to you, or I will lose my job. In either case, the responsibility is yours. And how did he respond? He called and he said, This is Elie Wiesel. When shall I be there? After stumbling and looking through my papers for a date and we talked a few minutes, I went out of my office into the hallway and there were a group of teachers standing there and I said, Elie Wiesel said, Yes! 
And one of the teachers said, who is she? Well, as you know, Elie Wiesel is a he. And so in that moment, I realized I had some educating to do. I spoke with the headmaster, Ned Fox, and we outlined a plan. We included everyone we could think of in the community. I didn't want it to be an elite opportunity at a private school. It could have been. And Ned was very supportive of including students from all schools across the region. We created a curriculum about Elie Wiesel's life and his work. We got teachers together from all corners, told them of the opportunity, they taught, and then they each brought five or eight students to the auditorium and had a dialogue. And so on the given day, March 12th, 1997, 700 students appeared in the auditorium for a dialogue with Elie Wiesel. I imagine it must have been quite a profound moment for you. In that moment, more than profound, I was thrilled to share this great man with these wonderful students. After the presentation and dialogue with the students and a celebratory event, the next morning, on the way to the airport, he posed a challenge. What was that challenge? He said to me, Stephanie, I've never seen a community like this community. You can't stop now. You must do more, and I will help you. Create a foundation. Invite a world-renowned humanitarian. Create curriculum. Teach it across the region, and then bring them here. Do it on an annual basis. Voila, you have the answer. A whole new project. Stephanie, here you are in the car with Ellie Wiesel. He's posed this challenge to you. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? And what happens next? My first thought was, how do you say no to Ellie Wiesel? My second thought was, oh, a new challenge. I love a good challenge. And so I felt excitement, a sense of adventure, and possibility. So the next day, I immediately began contacting the people who had helped me, all the different organizations that joined us. I spoke with lawyers about what do you do here. Time Warner Cable had been a big partner with us. Would they help? And I, I rallied the people who I'd come to know through the project. And Jim Preston, may he rest in peace, volunteered to write the bylaws and do all the legal aspects for setting up a 501c3 nonprofit, the Echo Foundation. How did the name come about? Jim Mountjoy, who had helped us with all the public relations during the project, worked with me after Ellie's challenge and we spent a lot of time talking about what would Echo be. And eventually, Jim said, reverence, almost on bended knee, reverence for humanity, and to echo the message of human dignity, justice, and moral courage that Elie Wiesel brought to Charlotte. Stephanie, what role did Ellie Wiesel play in the Echo Foundation over the years? Ellie was a huge inspiration every day. His life, his work, his teaching was a challenge as well as an inspiration for me personally. I spoke with him at least once a month for almost 20 years. I met with him often. He invited me to conferences all over the world. He introduced me to many of the leaders who would later become our guests. He challenged me to do more. He had creative ideas. In 1999, at a meeting once, 
he was saying, oh, we're on the cusp of a new, a new decade, a new century. And he said, you must do something really important. Okay, I said. He said, bring together a hundred small children. And he gestured like second graders, little children. Call it living together in the 21st century. And you'll know everything else to do. To be worthy of his investment, his trust, his belief in me personally, in Echo, and in our city, was a tremendous gift and a tremendous responsibility. So you talk to him every month for 20 years. What would you talk about? We talked about the state of the world. We talked about politics. We talked about religion. We talked about art and music. He loved music. Sometimes he would sing a song for me on the telephone. Mainly we talked about Echo's place in the world, how we would do what would make the biggest impact, what did the students want, what did they need, how would we teach, how would we infuse in them our belief in humanity and our duty to serve. Also, I would ask him when I had challenges and dilemmas and I didn't know what to do next. I would call him and say, Ellie, you know, this and this and this has happened. What shall I do? And he always had a brilliant answer. He was very gentle, at the same time, very driven. Nothing was casual. Everything he said and did had meaning. He was a huge man in a very petite form. Stephanie, in 2016, Ellie Wiesel died. How did you learn about his passing? I had just returned from Bosnia, from our Footsteps Global Initiative, and it had been magnificent. The students who had participated were some of the finest young people you could know. We traveled all over Bosnia, including to Srebrenica, where there was the most awful genocide in the early 90s. We met with mother who had lost her son, her husband, her brother. And over the course of studying with these students and then traveling with them, I'd grown so close as they had grown to one another. So the end of our travels was bittersweet. I was really sad because I knew nothing would be again the way it had been. I arrived at home at midnight, and that next morning I got a call from someone who was very, very close to Ellie and to me, who told me he had died. And how did his death affect you? You know, I've, I've been a hospice volunteer and a family therapist, and I, I should have all the tools to deal with the death of someone so huge in my life. The question really isn't how did it affect me, but how does it affect me now, and how has it since his passing, and how will it in the future? I think there are two answers to that question. One is, he gave a huge gift, an enormous gift to Charlotte. He positioned Echo to be ready for the 21st century. He helped us lay the groundwork for more good work. The legacy that he has left is foremost in our minds. So his death 
in a way, is a continuation of his life for Echo. For me personally, it's a great loss. There's so many times I want to pick up the phone and hear his voice and ask my questions. I miss him greatly. The Echo Foundation is so closely identified with him with him no longer physically here, what are your thoughts about the future of the foundation and how Echo Foundation is perceived? That's a good question. Without Ellie's presence on Earth, I believe our responsibility is magnified many fold. Of course, we can't do what he did, but we can try. If we gather all our voices and do our best, we can honor his memory that way. The fact that he was Jewish and that there's a great influence of Judaism in our belief system, such as leaving the world better than you found it, not standing idly by when you see injustice, being responsible. I don't, I don't know that I have the answer yet, Mark. We are, we're struggling with that. We're translating that. And I believe, I believe the students will be the ones to help us. Stephanie, in 2017, at the 20th anniversary of the Echo Foundation, the foundation honored Samantha Power, former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. I understand some contributors to the Echo Foundation objected. Why? In December of 2016, the Arab countries of the United Nations got together and created a resolution that would force Israel to stop building in the territories. As one of the five originators of the United Nations, the U.S. has veto power. Samantha Power could have used her veto power and disallowed the resolution to stand. Instead, she abstained from the vote, and the resolution was passed. For ardent supporters of Israel, this was a great betrayal. You had become aware of these objections after you had invited Samantha Power. What did you do next? It's true, I learned about the very strong feelings of members in the Jewish community who were opposed to her coming to Charlotte as part of ECHO. I learned about that after we had invited her. It presented a quintessential ethical dilemma. Do I respond to the very strong justifiable feelings of one group? Or do I respond to the history of a woman who has done so much good for humanity for so many groups of people and also honor the invitation that we had extended? What I did was I spoke with many members leaders in the Jewish community asking their advice. I spoke with rabbis, I spoke with the heads of various Jewish organizations and asked their advice. I spoke with donors 
and ask to understand more clearly their great objection to her. Ultimately, as an organization with my board together, we decided to stand with the invitation that we had extended that Samantha Power's credentials separate from the issue that had been raised were so noteworthy, a Pulitzer Prize winner, Harvard professor, United Nations ambassador, genocide expert on halting genocide, documenting it, were so profound that it was decided that we would follow through on our invitation to her. Of course, the decision at the United Nations wasn't hers personally. This was a decision made by the Obama administration. That's absolutely true. Her choices were to resign or to do as she was asked. Stephanie, the foundation launched in 1997. It is now 2018. The challenges and opportunities before the foundation are different today than it was 20 years ago. What are you thinking about? And where is the foundation going as it scans the world today? It's impossible not to think about technology and the rapid change it is bringing to our world. Many people have been reading Yuval Noah Harari's books, Sapien and Homo Dias, and now 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. He's fascinating, intelligent, a magnificent speaker. So I was listening to an interview. An executive from Google was interviewing Harari. And Harari was talking about the speed at which technology is changing and all that we're learning today and what we're teaching, the skills we're teaching today, will be obsolete in five or ten years and that young people need to be prepared for many different careers. And so the interviewer said, I have two young children. What should I be teaching them? And Harari's answer I found fascinating. He said, the two most important things that we can teach young people today are emotional intelligence and mental stability and flexibility. So I thought about that a lot. And you know, all these 20 years, Echo has been teaching experientially emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? It's the capacity to recognize, control, and express your emotions and to engage in interpersonal relationships with respect and empathy. That's what ECHO has been doing for 20 years. Through the programs that we create and implement across the region, we're constantly asking, what will you do? Who are you? What do you have to give to humanity? It's all about how you use what you have. It's not the brain alone, it's the brain and the heart that makes a difference. And so Harari beautifully identifies that, the heart being the emotional intelligence and mental stability, your brain. So the two working together are essential. And the technology, well, that's another question. I wonder... There's so much emphasis on teaching technology and how fast it's moving. What about ethics? What about the ethics of technology or how the technology is used? So I did a little reading, checking various university catalogs, courses that are being taught. And I can tell you with great fear, not one that I read about has ethics courses in the numbers it has technology courses. Ethics is already left in the dust. How will teaching ethics ever catch up and keep a pace to teaching technology? And yet every thoughtful person is saying technology must be infused with ethics. But how is that going to happen? Are the technology teachers going to teach ethics? Well, that would be interesting. 
And this is a question for the world. How does Echo fit into this emerging landscape? We're evolving, trying to join the 21st century. We have a new social media platform. We're using technology in service to humankind. We're currently raising funds to build a new website, an interactive website. We have a great team. We're also intentionally building a younger board, bringing onto the board people of generations younger than what we typically have. And most exciting is our curriculum and this year's project called Charlotte, A Tale of Two Cities. We are teaching students based on a curriculum that was built by students about the disparity that exists in Charlotte and anywhere in the world. There are those who live comfortable, lovely lives, and then there are those who don't, who wonder where their next meal is coming from, where they're going to sleep that night. And it's time it's time for us to take a look across to the other side to understand, to know, and to take action. Stephanie, let's talk about your life. I'd like to begin with your parents. You have described your dad as the star and joy of his family. Tell me about your dad. My dad's name was Seymour Lewis Goldberg. He was a Renaissance man. He was brilliant He was, as you said, the star of his family. He went to MIT as a student two months after he turned 15. He was a mathematician, an award-winning photographer, a career military officer, a classical music expert. He could hear almost any piece of classical music and not only tell you the composer, but the year it was written and a devoted husband and father. He adored my mother, and that was evident always. There is an interesting story about how your father and your mother met, and it happens in World War II, where your father was a U.S. Army officer. So my dad had fought in World War II as an American soldier, been captured and escaped three times, and then, during the occupation, was asked to continue his military service. So it was in 1946 that he was assigned to help disband the concentration camp called Dachau in the town of Dachau in southern Germany. My mother, Vera Henschel, a blonde, light green-eyed German woman of Lutheran faith, had moved away from Leipzig, where she was born, as the Russians approached. She and her parents had moved to southern Germany to Kaufbeuern. During the occupation, then, there was a call for anyone who spoke English. They needed secretaries. My mother applied, got a position, and was included in a pool of secretaries who supported a small group of officers. Well, no one wanted to work for my dad. They were all afraid of him. My mother said, I'm not afraid of him. I'll be glad to be his secretary. And that was the beginning of a long love affair. They worked together and fell in love and eventually were married and had three daughters. So keep in mind, this was post-World War II, 1946-1947. Here was a Jewish man who'd fought in the war and was disbanding a concentration camp of his Jewish people. And he meets this blonde German girl. How could they possibly fall in love? It's a story for the ages. It defies all reason and is pure love and romance. It defines the power that love has over hatred. Your dad and mom returned back to the United States. How was your mom received by your dad's family? My mother was very worried. 
You can imagine a German young woman coming to the U.S. to a Jewish family after Hitler had perpetrated such atrocities and Germany was reeling from the devastation and disaster of the war. My mother was delighted and surprised to be welcomed so warmly by my father's family. They were thrilled because, remember, my dad was beloved and a star, and anything he did was considered wonderful. So she was the beneficiary of his reputation in the family and the community, and therefore it overcame any prejudice they might have had. How were you raised religiously? I was raised without religion at home. And I was taught, especially by my father, that religion builds barriers. That all people of faith really carry the same values of goodness and mercy and justice and love. So why would you want to draw lines between people? And he would say always, wars all of the wars were created because of religion, because of differences. Why do that? Why choose that when we as a family offer you an openness to all people? You were the daughter of a German Lutheran. Did you grow up in a German-speaking household? I did. I did, thankfully so. My German grandparents moved to the U.S. when I was a small child. My grandfather was an artist and taught me art lessons after school. We spoke German when Dad wasn't there. And then when Dad came home from work, we switched to English. We did that intentionally because my grandparents wanted to learn English. They wanted to honor him for including them in his home. And it was a great exercise for my sisters and me to see and understand up close what it means to act with dignity and respect and honor. By the same token, my father was always learning German. He always had a German newspaper with a dictionary beside him and would underline the words he didn't know and try to discuss philosophy with my grandfather or art with my grandmother. He always wanted to learn. And so sometimes there was a bit of German spoken when he was there, but it was, of course, easier to speak English. Do you speak German today, Stephanie? I do. I do. You grew up as Steffi Goldberg. Did people assume you were Jewish? Well, it's a good question, Mark. Growing up, I imagine a lot of people assumed that I was Jewish, but I didn't. I didn't know, believe it or not, that Goldberg was a recognizably Jewish name. I was probably in my early 20s, as strange as it sounds, that I came to realize I'd been wearing this Jewish name my whole life without realizing it. Today, I think many people assume that I am Jewish. I hope that they see at least part of me is Jewish. I hope my eyes betray my belief in all the goodness of Judaism, and that my heart represents both the Lutheran Christian principles, which are not different than the Jewish principles. I hope I'm the embodiment of both the Lutheran and the Jewish each day. Stephanie, you went to Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. Why Virginia Tech? And what did you study? I went to Virginia Tech, if I'm honest, 
because it is in the most magnificent location in the Appalachian Mountains. The fact that in those years, the ratio of one woman to, I think it was 10 men, of course, swayed the young girl I was. They offered such a marvelous array of disciplines, I knew I could find my way to something I wanted to do. I began by studying fashion design. And in high school, as a matter of fact, I had designed several pieces of clothing and won awards. And I loved the creative opportunity and textiles and color, and it fascinated me. And so that's what my career was going to be until I met organic chemistry. You ask why in fashion design do you need organic chemistry? Well, color, dyes, finishes on fabrics put me off, and I changed my major to child development. You went on to earn a master's degree in clinical psychology, and then you became an upper school counselor at Charlotte Latin School. What was that experience for you? I was hired to be the upper school counselor at Latin because I'm a family therapist. And the headmaster of the school was very keen on the idea of addressing any issue with a student, a systems perspective, which is the family. If a child is struggling academically, the best resource they have in most cases, particularly at an independent school, is their family. So all of the work I did there was not with just a student struggling with depression or grades or sports. It was always in the context of their family. It was marvelous work. I was there eight years and found it more fulfilling than I can really describe. Stephanie, the Echo Foundation confronts great misery in the world, historical and current crimes against humanity. How do you bear that witness? You've touched on something very, very painful. When we look at Syria today, how, how can we sleep at night? The only thing I know to do within my realm my sphere of influence is to shape young people into compassionate, knowledgeable leaders who are willing to take responsibility. I do that in the hope and with faith that they will take what they learn and bring about change, positive change in the world, that one day we will be led by people who will not tolerate what is going on in Syria or Venezuela or so many places of pain and anguish in the world. That's that's what I feel I can contribute. I have three favorite quotes that guide me. One, Morgan Freeman said to a young woman in a film who wanted to become a boxer. He said, it's the magic fighting for a dream that nobody sees but you. One of my favorite quotes by Elie Wiesel, when one child is hungry, we are all responsible. Camus tells us, We must invent hope where there is none. Stephanie, as we conclude our conversation, what can one person do? One person can do so much. One person can find the cure for cancer or write poetry that transcends language or dance on a stage to bring joy and inspiration to an audience. One person 
can take the recycling for an elderly neighbor to the street each week, or smile to a child who has no one smiling to them. One person can change the world in grand ways or in small ways. One person can do a lot. When we think of the huge world we live in, maybe we can change that. Is it politics? Is it literature? Is it science? Is it activism? And what about our own community? What can we do here, in our neighborhood, on our street? Who walks by that we smile to? Who do we help who just needs a momentary hand? How do we create a world that is kinder and gentler? And what about our own thinking? How can we shape our own thinking to be open and generous and creative and welcome the other and ideas that are not our own? How can one person make a difference? Well, infinite ways. Thank you for your time today, Stephanie. It's been a pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much. Stephanie Ansaldo is founder and president of the Echo Foundation. She earned a bachelor's degree in child development from Virginia Tech University and a master's degree in clinical counseling from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And now, a personal word. I read Night sometime in high school in 1978. I was a sophomore at North Miami Beach Senior High School in North Miami Beach, Florida, the home of the Chargers. I was 15 years old. I was zoned for another high school closer to my home, but NMB High School had a stronger academic reputation at the time. The only way to attend NMB was to take a course that my home school didn't offer. I chose Hebrew. My teacher was Mrs. Goldsmith. I remember her as a blonde and passionate Zionist, in that order. We had a white soft cover textbook with Hebrew letters on the cover. The back of the book was the front of the book, and we read from left to right. We practiced our letters. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vab, Zayn, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Haf, Lamed, Mem, Nud, Samech, Ein, Pe, Sadi, Kof, Resh, Shin, and Tav. We learned the two ways to write letters, print and written. We learned the Nikud, the series of dots and lines that changed a consonant to a vowel, or at least we tried. We drilled with flashcards, and we wrote our first word, Abba, or Father. This would go on for weeks. We would come into class, and Mrs. Goldsmith would teach us words and how to spell them and work tirelessly to have us speak sentences. I did my best, but I did not get an Aleph in the class. What I remember well was Mrs. Goldsmith also teaching us Jewish history and literature. She talked passionately about Mount Sinai and the Torah, the Diaspora and the Holocaust, and the extraordinary contributions of Jews to the arts and sciences. We watched newsreels of the Shoah, black and white movies on a film projector of Auschwitz and Sobibor and Treblinka. We watched bulldozers bury hundreds of emaciated bodies piled in pyramids. We sat in the dark in silence, long before trigger warnings and counseling sessions, and we would ask questions afterward. Mrs. Goldsmith assigned papers asking us to compare the short stories of Jewish authors. I compared The Rise of David Levinsky by Abraham Kahan with Gimple the Fool by Isaac Beshevis Singer. The short stories were in an anthology entitled The Literature of American Jews, 
Elie Wiesel wrote the foreword to the anthology. Wiesel said this about the Jewish writers in the book, that they are bearers of a haunting memory and ancient promise, dreamers and rebels who persist in trying to change the world and man through words. Of course, Wiesel was writing about himself. Wiesel set about changing the world through words. I read Night, an early edition, with a black and white cover and the title written in the black letter typeface of the Third Reich. Wiesel once said that if he had not written Night, he would not have written anything else. It was the work upon which the rest of his life stood. Night is not a memoir. It is not fiction. It is somewhere in between, an autobiographical novel. Night tells the story of a teenager named Eliza, sent with his family to the camps on a cattle wagon. Their arrival at Auschwitz-Birkenau, the separation of the men to the left and the women to the right, the ovens and the smoke, the indifference and efficiency of the SS officers and the kapos, death marches and the search for food, starvation, the death of his father, and the death of God. I read the book wondering if I could have survived, wondering if I could ever write such words, wondering if I would live to honor the Jewish blood within me. I imagine a line of people standing on a hillside across time. One person is in orthodox clothing from a decade long ago. Another person is in modern dress. Each is whispering to each other. There is something they are saying. Some bow their heads, others smile. As they whisper, the voices echo. Elie Wiesel and Mrs. Goldsmith and Stephanie Ansaldo are in that line. Stephanie has devoted her life to peace, atonement, and human dignity. She bears witness. She teaches. She inspires. She does her work with care and reverence. There is something noble about us yet. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to on life and meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>